This is County Executive Steve Shu. You're listening to the Maryland Crabs Podcast. Live from a grungy kitchen table located in Annapolis, Maryland's scenic and historic capital, it's the Maryland Crabs Podcast. With each episode, your hosts, Tim Hamilton, John Fernay, and the occasional guest will dive in and pick apart the stuff that really matters most to you. We're too lazy to actually solve any of these problems, but we can definitely stir the pot. From schools, politics, parking in the fire lane, to those horrible people who drive BMWs. And here with this week's episode, live from the kitchen table, Tim Hamilton and John Frenet. Hey, it's the Maryland Crabs, and we are back again here at the Commons. And it's after a post-debate hangover, I guess is what it would be called. Yeah, I feel it'd be let down. You know, the debate was a lot of fun. Putting it together, I mean, that was sorry about the super long two and a half hour episode that you I'm not sorry. had uh, last week. You guys aren't paying for this. Uh, we're back to our hour this week, which is kind of exciting. But boy, I'll tell you, our episode with Gavin back in March, did that like kind of blow up? I'm trying to figure if we should feel guilty about anything because I just feel guilty naturally. I'm Irish. So I think that uh, I don't feel guilty. No. Well, I'll tell you. We were, we were political pawns. That's what we were. Yeah. I, I, I agree. Panelides uses. I'm a rook. Pan- a knight. <laughs> Panelides uses. And I was amazed. The Capitol, they wrote an article on it, and they actually named us and linked us. Through gritted teeth. Rick must have been on vacation. I think Rick's mad at us. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, no, it was uh, pretty impressive because uh, Mike Panelides did a big mailer and his video on Gavin's Ferris wheel. The video was funny. I'm not, not going to lie. I, I did laugh. It was pretty oh, funny. Oh, oh, it was. It and was. It was funny to me as well was Gavin's response on Facebook where he said there will be no Ferris wheel. And I felt like a dad telling us that there was going to be no trip to Disneyland. There will be no trip to Disneyland. Yeah. There will be no Ferris wheel. I'm like, oh, I kind of wanted a Ferris wheel. Why not? You know, well, I, I Could th- he, if he said probably no Ferris wheel, I would have felt better. I think it's funny, though, that you look at the divisiveness that that whole issue caused because I am still not 100 percent convinced that he wasn't serious. Well, I think that... And I mean, I I get that he was throwing ideas out. This is, you know, we need to have this, 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 this. That just seemed a little too well thought out to me. Like I said before, this is his brand. He is a out-of-the-box thinker. He's going to come up with ideas that seem kind of crazy because he's a marketer is really what he is. Right. I mean, look what he did down the Fringe Festival and the Chocolate Festival and the Dinner of the Stars. I mean, I know he had helped with all those things. But that's his brand is coming up with just crazy ideas and seeing which ones stick. So in that context, I think the Ferris wheel... Sure. I mean, if you go, well, how are you going to pay for it? How are you? That's really not kind of the point. The point is he comes up with these huge ideas and winnows them down. We're certainly not to the point where we need to figure out whether we need to pay for it. But yeah. maybe, maybe it makes sense to have the conversation of, does that make sense? Somebody needs to say, no, it doesn't. That's stupid. Then you move on. Or someone says, well, hey, maybe that requires additional conversation. I don't know. Well, I think that if this is the apex of the arguments that we have as far as nastiness, then I'm pretty happy with it because Mike's campaign has to make hay out of this. I mean, you're looking for any chinks in the armor and you're you're exploiting any vulnerabilities that you think you see. So you got to kind of explore them. And this is one that I think the Panelides campaign thought they should explore. And really, I mean, it's that this is fairly typical. I don't think it was nasty. I think this is just what you do, mm-hmm. you know, as opposed to dropping salacious tidbits. Uh, about people and their past indiscretions and what have you that we had all this weekend in Ward 1. Right. Um, you know, those are the ways I don't like to see it go, but unfortunately that that's ingrained in our political culture. So really, well, we're, we're going to have more coming over the next couple of weeks, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've probably heard of some other ones coming. So it'll be interesting leading into the election to see where it goes. I don't, and you and I were talking before we started recording, I just don't like the mob mentality that have developed around social media, especially Facebook. We saw this, you know, last year or a couple of years ago with the guy who owned the Steak and Shake up in Millersville and on Veterans Day. And you had literally hundreds, if not thousands of comments of people saying, shut him down, boycott him. And no one went to go talk to him. The same way when the whole L.E.T. or anything kind of hit the paper this weekend, I saw that same kind of mob mentality. And it's just people who are very sure that they're right about something and very self-righteous. You know, I'm not saying that it doesn't warrant discussion. I'm just saying that there's a lot of people who are pretty high and mighty, and it just bothers me. That's the part of social media I don't like. We need to take a step backwards. People aren't going to, though. The genie's out of the bottle. This is kind of where we are at this point. I just I don't like it. That's true. Coming up today, we've got Dr. Dan Nataf, who's... Uh, we spent a lot of time with him lately. Yeah, right? he's our new BFF. Yeah. Uh, he's got great insight, and he has released his semi-annual survey. What kind uh, of survey? Of the thoughts and everything of Anne Arundel Lins. Anne Arundel Lins? We don't have a word for that. No. Hmm. News guys. Yeah. No, that's taken. Jersey's I took, oh, so there was this quiz the New York Times had. It was a linguist to quiz, speaking of which, and it's where it's this long questionnaire of like 
50 questions where you, how you pronounce this and what words you have. Right. And it'll pinpoint exactly where you're from. New York Times. Yeah. Yeah. And they it said it's spooky. Fabulous. Yeah. So I did it and it, I am from Winston Salem, North Carolina, apparently. But I mean, it's actually, but I, they have a hot spot, what region you're in. And they said, I'm most likely from Winston Salem, but I, I am within the area. And, and this, this part of, when part, I took part it, of they Maryland got, was, they got me pretty good. It was, uh, spot on with North Jersey, with, South Jersey and Maryland. Yeah. So I picked up a little bit through my life and that's sort of where it's been. But so those surveys are pretty fun. Now this survey that, uh, that Dr. Taft did is more kind of the socio-political map of Anne Arundel County, where people are with their thought process. Uh, Absolutely. Is that the approval rates? I'm looking at a screensaver here and we've got the London eye. Yeah, so we have, a, we have a big screensaver that I'm talking, and John just keeps looking over my shoulder, which is starting How to take me off. That's beautiful that be on City Doc? But there's this huge screensaver that's about 52 inches long, and it, it, it's this, like, drone going over London at night, and there's the big Ferris wheel. And you know what? That looks pretty cool, actually. Yeah. yeah. I don't it, think it, that's bad. It, it really does. But but we're going to talk about the pulse of the Anne Arundelians and see what they have to think about all sorts of different things, politics, economy, drugs, and everything else with Dr. Natap, who does a wonderful job on the survey every year. And he was just absolutely invaluable for the debate. Yeah. He, as, he was great. Well, first of all, he was grown up as opposed to us. So True. he handled it pretty well. And going through the process with him, and we said in the whole process of getting the questions down, we sat down with him for a couple but, hours one day. And then we got the questions ready on our own. And then John and I would go back and forth and argue a lot. And then we'd send them to our teacher, Dr. Natap, who would then kind of redline it and send it back. So we kind of crafted all the questions, even though there's only a certain number of, or a certain kind of questions you can ask. I mean, all the debates have kind of the same questions because there's only seven or eight topics, really. That It was a procedure. But I will say that uh, also, if I've been watching our, our ratings and stuff like that, and we're not getting enough of them. On oh, Apple Podcast and iTunes or whatever you want to call we it. We can get in the stars. We can get in or whatever it is. Well, no, we've got the good stars, but we need more of them. In the so if you're listening to this, just click over to iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and give us a, a rating. Leave us a, what's it called, review? Quick review. Wherever you get them, do them, because they are important. They help us grow. They help us get Yeah, them. they don't just feed our egos, which they don't, uh, because I know you guys are doing us favors. But also, it really helps with the algorithms that Apple puts out there, so that when people are looking for podcasts, depending on the reviews and the keywords that are used, then it recommends us to more people. So it's, it's for the sake of visibility. So we really appreciate everyone who gives us the ratings and reviews because that really, it honestly does help us a lot. And, yeah, and, and do that the same for more power to you and the Annapolis podcast and Annapolis Pike, all the other local podcasts, you know, give them, give them a little help too. Yeah, no, absolutely. And also don't, don't just limit it to iTunes. I mean, if you've got a friend that might be interested in what we're saying, uh, tell them, let them know about us and let them know about our Facebook page, the Maryland Crabs podcast or our Twitter is MD Crabs MD podcast. podcast. Yeah, we, why can we never remember that? I know it's a tough one. And then, uh, of course, our website is the MarylandCrabs.com. And you can get in there. You can see all the episodes. You can see all the crab cakes and everything else that we've done there. We did one with uh, Daryl Sturmer, who was the lead guitarist for Genesis, which was kind of yeah, fun. Yeah, that. And Mark Crooks, the one that you did with uh, Judge Circuit Court Judge Mark Crooks, was he was a lot of fun. He really was. Uh, you know, when you click with someone right away, when you kind of understand. Uh, oh, here, here's Doctor Tap right now. Looking all over for you. Uh, oh, look at you. <laughs> I've looked at everywhere except in this around the corner. Oh no, we're in the comments. Doc. He's got a sheaf of papers. Well, why don't we jump right into it? Wow. Sounds good. Are you, are you ready to jump into it? I'm always ready to jump. <laughs> all right. There we go. Let's get your mic all situated. Okay. There, there we go. Perfect. So you're at the comments. So how have you been? Ah, uh, you know, it's been very busy. You've got your survey out? That is true. And uh, that uh, took up an enormous amount of time for quite a long period of time. It's, it's like a... Uh, it's like a month-long ordeal from sort of design into recruiting students and making sure everybody knows what they're doing and getting all the rooms situated and, and then getting preparatory materials together, um, having the survey I and mean, conducting it at night and being there and so forth, and then going through a huge process of uh, press release creation and then having it go through many eyes and you know, you think that all the little imperfections are gone, but you always find one or two here or there. And so it's a never ending process. Now, how, how do you do that? I mean, do these, uh, yeah, I say these kids, but the students of yours conduct the survey, correct? Uh, they are the ones calling the residents of Anne Arundel County. That's true. Now, are they at, are they at home don't, doing these or is there? Oh, no, no. This is all a, in it's school? all it occurs within the career center. So it's a building on campus where we, uh, essentially have asked the, faculty to donate uh, their offices for an evening 
And as it turns out, it's usually four evenings. And so they, uh, they provide us with the phones and some room on their desks. Um, and the students are uh, usually packed two to a room. That's what faculty have as a arrangement. It's usually two to a room. And so, um, you know, they learn not to talk over each other and to kind of concentrate on what's going on. How on many the students phone. are doing it? Well, uh, on any given night, it's around 25. Uh, wow, could be a okay. little more. Um, and it's four nights. So some are repeating, so it's not 100 unique uh, right. uh, uh, students that are doing that. It's probably something like 50 or 60 uh, that are participating. Some do just one night. Some do two or three nights. It just depend, depends on the arrangement with the faculty. The faculty member determines uh, what kind of incentive they're going to provide. Some of them uh, are doing it for service learning, and that's like a requirement. They get no extra anything. It's just they have to do it to pass the class. In my classes, I give them extra credit if they, if they do more than uh, one night. Um, the, the minimum anybody does is one, is one night. So that's oh, so they're required to for your class? Huh? They're required to for the class it is required to pass my classes yeah um and uh, you know others it, it just varies in terms of what the requirements or incentives are um i uh, have for my students and the service learning students but well, first uh, step back the service learning students need 20 hours of uh, community service and that's a lot of hours and so even if they're spending uh, two hours each night for four nights. It's only eight hours. So we had to kind of build out the pro the program. And so what I did is I added a, a first meeting uh, where we discuss uh, the nature of surveying and what it is as a methodology, how it works, the different ways in which you can survey populations, the kinds of errors that creep in uh, both statistically and in terms of design, the kinds of question framing and so forth. You just go through all that and then you, um, you have them look at some prior results because we've been doing this for years and years and so we have lots of prior results and then they can see something about what they can expect. And so this sets them up with a sense of where they're going. And then after that, they do their nights on the phone. And then again, my students and service learning students then have a final meeting. The final meeting, we uh, talk about the process, you know, what were their expectations about uh, dealing with the public? Uh, did they have uh, strange respondents? I had one student said it took them 50, 5 -oh minutes to get through so the 15 minute survey, mostly because this person. <laughs> Wanted to explain every answer, answer that they provided. Oh, so he uh, called my wife, didn't he? Uh, I think it was a guy. So, oh, yeah. and so, uh, but uh, in any case, um, so sometimes it drags on. Sometimes it's pretty efficient. It really depends on both the student, how quickly they can read, how clearly they can read, uh, and the respondent, how well they understand what's being said and their kind of mental engagement in the process overall. But at that last meeting, what we do is we look, first of all, it's a debriefing, then we look at general results, and then we have a hypothesis testing um, that lasts about 45 minutes. I make every student that's there offer a hypothesis, some relationship between two variables. So, you know, gender and the Trump vote. Or I always start them out with income and education and try to get them thinking in terms of what does a hypothesis look like? Well, you know, you kind of establish an independent and dependent variable. And let's look at education and, and income, which is likely to be the dependent variable. And so you can kind of say, okay, income is dependent variable, education independent variable. You throw a cross, tra a cross tab up and you show them uh, for every level of education, here's how they concentrate in terms of income levels. So I say, okay, you want to earn more than 100000 you need a four-year degree. It's, it, it jumps up when you get yeah. when you hit a four-year degree, and you you hit the it's it's this household income, so it doesn't have to be an individual income, but it still it jumps up. So anyway, we we see this, and uh, and then we go on to other uh, variables, their variables, whatever they have as an as an area of interest. And so once they get the hang of it, I think, you know, they like it because this is fruits of their labor. They're seeing uh, the results of the survey they just conducted. I appreciated that in school, too. Mm -hmm. You know, when you, as opposed to just book smarts and lecturing and whatnot right, to sit right. there and see and hand. Now, you've been doing the survey for since 
95. 95. Yeah, a meet personally. The, the center has been kicking around since around 1980. So, okay. Uh, yeah, it was created by the previous generation of, uh, of social scientists. Multi-generational survey. Well, it went, it's, I'm the second generation. We're seeing whether the third one will exist, but I hope so. So your and sample size was around 533, I think it was? 553 in this case. Yeah. Now, I should tell you that we have been uh, trying to adapt to um, the changes in the sort of calling environment over the last you know decade or so. Since so many households now have uh, cell phones, about seven years ago, I decided to start asking people if once we reached them, whether it's through cell phone or, or uh, landline, uh, whether they would be willing to participate as a web panelist uh, so that uh, I can have them include them in these surveys without having to call them. And so I get about 40% of my calls. Uh, in this case, we did about 350 completions. And so 40% of them provided an email address. And so the next time, I'm going to send them a, a solicitation to participate via email. So that gets me like 150 to 200 completions right there. Well, sure. I don't have to work really hard, right? And so... Now, would they be additional completions or would they be... No, I, I bundle them into the into the telephone. It's a multimodal okay. thing. I didn't know whether you were going to use that to be able to expand that to instead of having 500 and some... No, to I mean, it, that's both together. It's okay. 553 is both together. And so the, you know, it's, it's, you get a different crowd online. The online crowd is uh, wider, richer, and more well educated. And so, uh, and, and as a result, it's less really representative of the general population than the phone calls uh, respondents are. And so uh, it's actually, it wouldn't be a good thing just to rely on the online uh, population. You know, and it's, a, it's weird because it's an exact subset of the same people we call, but it's just 40 some percent say yes to the question, can I get your email address? Uh, and the, there must be some sampling kind of process by which minorities, lower income, lower ed people just don't say yes. And so we end up with this skewed sample. So in, in, the, to kind of deal with all that, um, what I do is I try to hit three targets in my weighting scheme for the uh, survey. And so the survey becomes weighted on party, on gender, and on education level. And when I put all three of those together, I started off with uh, just putting in the raw data. Uh, I would have, I asked them, and I always like to try to find a question that I can use that has some real world number attached right. to it. It's not like some diffuse attitude where there's no real world number. And so I asked them, how did you vote uh, last November uh, for President Trump Clinton? And so I started off um, with a 10 point Clinton lead after I waited by those three variables uh, I got 37% on both sides, which was about the, I mean, it's a one point difference was the actual difference, but you have to throw out some of the people who didn't vote and so forth. So 37% for both sides was an exact hit on the, on the real world number. So this gives you some confidence that uh, the rest of the sample, as it's now been weighted, is probably accurate in terms of a description of the general population. Okay. The other thing that I do, the other real world number that I hit, uh, or I, at least I, that I use as a, as a foil against which I judge the accuracy of what I've done, is the Gallup poll on uh, presidential job approval. So I asked for job approval at the county exec, governor, and presidential levels. Uh, we obviously don't have anything uh, systematic for the first two. But for the president, Gallup asks like every day, sure. you know, how's, how's it going with that president? And so the last time uh, I was out in the field, um, I, I counted on, on Gallup about, because we started on the 6th and we ended up on the 12th. So I took the 8th as a day uh, for Gallup's, you know, the, whatever it was on that day. And it was 36% job pool for, for Trump national, nationally. And we were at 35, uh, 34%. So we have been tracking almost exactly. It, it was weird because under in, in the Obama period, we would track below uh, the, the national Gallup polling by a few, points. which would make which would make sense. Yeah, for yeah, yeah Anne Arundel, which sense. is typically a, a more it's, Republican leaning. It, it is. I mean, prior to Obama, oh, am, I, am I saying this correctly? Now, Obama didn't win. Uh, Obama didn't win uh, either case. So prior to Clinton, right? She's the first one since LBJ. That actually uh, 
came in first as a Democrat. Now, again, she came in first in part because there were 5,000 write-in ballots and some, I think, 15,000 Gary Johnson votes uh, right, that, Stein. that took away, right? Sure. And so, um, and Jill Stein. So it was a lot of fragmentation and her vote number wasn't particularly high, but it was people on sort of the right that flaked away from the Trump ticket. Well, you would have seen that again, maybe in 92 with Ross Perot. Yeah, but Clinton did not win in Arundel County. In 92? Yeah, yeah okay. either, either 92 or 96, actually, did better nationally. Because Perot wasn't really a factor then, right? Uh, but even then, he didn't win, and so because I mean, Perot was Clinton, the first, Clinton, the the wife was the first Democrat that came in first. Because Perot was the first independent that made a significant, or at least recent, in my yeah. recent mind, yeah, made yeah. a significant dent in the electorate. Yeah, in ninety two, he was definitely a factor. You know, this political science will forever go down and ask, did he take more away from Bush than he did from from Clinton or Democrats? And you know, it's hard to know for sure, but. Uh, all we know is that Bush was riding a 90 percent job approval during the uh, Desert Storm, and he managed to lose. <laughs> What's the combination of all the polls? Is that real clear politics uh-huh. that combines all yes. the polls, and that is that the most effective way to look at the polls? Because um, that, that's an average of all the polls. It, you know, it's hard to know what the most effective. The most effective way is to find the poll that tends to be right all the time and look at that one. <laughs> uh, but uh, the real clear politics takes um, it does nothing to really account for house differences, you know, how, how it was one, a, uh, a um, digital voice recorder system. And so those are, those can only call landlines, right? Okay. And so uh, it excludes all the people who tend to be cell phone users. So they'll be older. So you're going to be older, whiter, and all the rest. Right. And so, yeah. Uh, and so that, you know, but again, the people who do that, uh, Ross Mewson polls are the most well-known, perhaps. Um, you know, they weighed it and they, they can, they can make well, magic what out was of it. It was the LA Times poll, I think it was, during the election, was a little bit different. It wasn't, what did they, they asked for, was it likely voters? Oh, yeah, or? that's right. You, you, you like that because that was the most, that was more accurate than the other. Well, yeah. It was the USC poll. It was, I think it was LA Times USC poll. Was it, yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, it actually, it went too far the other way. Uh, in the end, because national polling, I mean, uh, Clinton won and right. they had Trump winning. So they were off. Right, right. Uh, and so they just went off the other way. And so their methodology uh, was a little different. And, you know, it, it kind of was a nice counterpoint to so many of the other polls, which had a hard time coming to grips with the erosion of the Clinton um, level of support. But, you know, the, 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 she still won the part. You know, this is America, so you got to win the Electoral College. Right. You shouldn't be doing national polls. You need to go to, to, to kind of purple states and do those polls. But generally, those don't have many polls. They don't do Wisconsin polls every, every three right. days. <laughs> right, right. Every so, you know, you, you're, you're not, you don't have a very good trend line to look at. And so it's hard to know, should you be uh, quickly going to, to Michigan and Wisconsin and, and trying to shore up your vote? Or, you know, do you go off to Georgia and Arizona and try to go play with them? Um, and, you know, in hindsight, we all know. I mean, she, I hadn't read her book, What Happened? But uh, in hindsight, we know that that, that was crazy. <coughs> she should never have gone off to Arizona and Georgia thinking that somehow she's going to pull those off. But early voting kind of had it so close. It looked competitive there. And so based on that point in time, she went, this is why she blames James Comey with having mm-hmm. lost the election because she says, if I was doing so well back then and, you know, look at Access uh, Hollywood, I thought that was his undoing, she would have said to herself. So how is it possible in this world that against that guy with all the baggage he had and I had this solid lead forever that I lost? It can't be. And so I think she, you know, she was riding on a, a certain complacency that came in because of the, the polling you know, polling is kind of predictive, but, it, you know, it's snapshots in time. It's a, it's a rolling snapshot, right? And so if you're up here and, you know, you kind of like staying up there for right. a while, you figure, well, that's it. I've, I've won. I'm here. But in her defense, no one would have predicted Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. I mean, that, that, 
I mean, that was uh, well, a... Well, uh, Wisconsin and Michigan were both won by Bernie Michigan. Sanders. Right. Bernie Sanders won both in the primaries. She should have saw, seen that as a shot across the bow, disaffected people, not happy with establishment candidates of which she was one. You know, again, we can go and talk about what would have happened. But she wasn't. She was looking at Democrat. I mean, she's saying that those are full, thoroughly Democrats. She wasn't looking at the individual candidate. She goes, well, if even even though I lost to my primary candidate, they're still going to vote Democrat because they always vote Democrat. Yeah, but are they going to turn out? Well, no one. That's but that's what no one took into account except for maybe Nate Silver. You know, that was. Well, he was. He wasn't. So he wasn't. So he, he was sure that she. No, no, he was said, too. But I mean, after the fact, he was, he was, he was the, off. I mean, polling uh, all the prognosticators. We're not pronounce that word. to be uh, uh, admired for their uh, insights. They basically went with the flow and thought uh, Clinton was going to win right to the end. I mean, I, I have I did a PowerPoint. I generated so many different. I went to every source I could find showing uh, that um, they were con, you know, obviously way overconfident that she was going to win and, and Trump was going to lose even in these states. I mean, some of them were very specific and said, here's this state. She's going to win. They're saying, they, you know, it was it was a it was a moment of tremendous hubris and self, um, you know, assertion and confidence. Um, but again, uh, but were those states? Was that was that a black swan event, or is that the new normal? Saying, hey, we have to re- rethink exactly how they're going to vote. And obviously, that Democratic the blue wall is gone. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's hard to say uh, to what extent this was a singular event. I mean, both she as the first woman candidate. And the wife of a previous president. I mean, how many of those are we ever going to get? Right. And then uh, a reality show uh, kind of, you know, casino entrepreneur as the opponent. That is a pretty unusual circumstance. So both sides, it's an unusual circumstance. So, yeah, it, it has black swan qualities. There's no doubt of that. On the other hand, we also know that uh, the uh, Democratic establishment has not pulled together a very convincing record really since the election of, of Barack Obama. I mean, the 2010 election was cra- was a catastrophe. The 24th, the 2014 election, a bigger catastrophe. And so they're not doing something right. There's something about the messaging uh, and how they're defining their coalition, uh, which is is fine in you know certain some states, California, they win overwhelmingly. But when you're getting into some of these Particularly, kind of midwestern states that had manufacturing and it's kind of blue collar white guys that are losing jobs and stuff. The coalition is not as obvious, and so there. That's why I think Bernie uh, and his kind of call for a greater attack on inequality. It's not so much that Clinton didn't say things like that, but she didn't make him front and center. And there was there was a lot of identity politics and some economic justice. Uh, Sanders went the other way. It was economic justice first and then some identity politics. And I think in states like the upper Midwest, that's the better formula for Democrats to run with. Um, because it's, that, that's odd is because, well, let's look at Western Pennsylvania, for example, which I understand it's like a platypus when it comes to voters. That's a category all into itself is that they've traditionally been Democrats, but they don't have Democratic views. They're very conservative. So you, they would identify now as Republicans because there's been a shift, but they're also pro-union because it's a manufacturing area, or at least it was. But there isn't. That's the problem is that all these people were unionized in coal mills and steel right. they mills. They all identify that. that, that yeah, they all identify as as an industrial area, but it, then you say the Rust Belt, but there's really nothing there anymore. And but it, well, white workers, places where there are a lot of white individuals who are kind of working class and working in, in smokestack industries, those people are not a natural coalition mate with minorities and uh, immigrants and all this. That's just scads of labor market competition and misplaced focus. I don't understand. Well, because they, you know, their 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 sense is, why am I losing my job and why are we catering to others? Why aren't you catering to me? Why aren't you solving my unemployment problem? This is why, you know, coal country was Trump country. Uh-huh. Why? Because he could talk to them as uh, the forgotten people. And they are. Yeah. I mean, here's the amazing stat. Okay. I mean, I, this is the amazing stat. Are you going to talk about the number of coal miners? No. Uh-huh. No, there's only 75,000. Yeah. But, well, that's not even miners. That's in the industry. That's truck drivers and equipment. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. But the, the, I was, I looked at uh, Clinton, um, that I say Bill Clinton's vote in 1996. And then I compared it to her vote 
in uh, 2016. So this is a 20-year difference. Right? The state where she lost the most votes compared to his vote count in 96, the number one state was West Virginia. Huh. The second uh, state was Arkansas, there own, where he was governor. State. Right, right. So uh, you know they 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 became they became Davos, right? They became something else. They became the Clinton Foundation. They be, and it just seemed like whatever roots they had in kind of Hope, Arkansas, they pulled uh, them up. And they became Manhattan roots, you know. Yeah, yeah, well, she, and she was New York's senator New York, and true. so forth. And so there was this transformation of the pre- the people they were to the people they. Had become maybe so but but then so you start looking at you're by far much more educated than i am in this but that would assume that the states the that the socioeconomic or even the the political leanings of those states stayed the same in the last 20 20 years so west virginia has traditionally been democratic mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. but they're they're not democrats they're they're, well, they're certainly not cultural democrats exactly and that's yeah. what i'm and saying so, so kind of, you're you're just hanging on the economic side and trump was able to appeal to them on that side as but well. But also Fox News, if you look at the, Fox News was founded in 1996, which has become a juggernaut in the elections. So the people who are, I think if you go to West Virginia, that the, if you ask anyone where they get their news, it's going to be Fox, even though, I mean, I don't even know if they're still registered as Democrat or Republican, but I mean, they've been Republican, at least like you said, in culturally Republican, mm-hmm. although Democrat in name. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I don't know if that's an apples to apples. You know, it's a different world 20 years ago than... Well, it was, but I'm just saying, you know, we got two Clintons and two points in time. And to go from uh, a state where you win to a state where you lose astronomically tells you how the world has changed in terms of the Democratic coalition. Is there a Venn diagram between the Trump supporters and the Bernie supporters? Um, I don't have it. There may be one that shows overlaps. Um and I don't know to what extent. Um, like, because you, you certainly saw people that. who did, who voted for Bernie and said to themselves, "I won't vote for Clinton. I'm going to vote for Trump instead." Uh, was that by I utility, think, or was that because of uh, philosophy? I think again that the economic justice argument was buried in the. I mean, you know, Clinton's coming out as the the first woman candidate, and you know she gets uh, circled by all the culturally diverse groups of America, and mm-hmm. that's her coalition. And so, people who have fundamentally an economic justice issue. I mean, it's not a race justice issue that it could be economic, but it's just a plain old class issue. They feel, they're feeling like the, you know, times are really hard. They're working too long, too many hours. The good jobs they had are gone. The unions have been pummeled, so forth and so on. That's the person who is on the margins of the Democratic coalition and for whom it's not, again, if you look at her program, you'll see Plenty of specifics uh, about, uh, you know, moving into renewable energies and a zillion jobs that would be created by that or transitional um, aid that would go for rebuilding skills and in, in industries that have been adversely ha- affected by trade. Th- those things are there, but it's not how you perceive her. You it's it's a marketing perce- issue. Uh, it's yes, I think that's it's very much that. I mean, because if you think about Western PA and Ohio and all these areas when they're talking about the coal mines, I'm bringing coal back. There's, there's, I mean, that's two generations removed. I mean, yeah. those, those. I mean, we're not talking about miners who are sitting out of work. You have people who are sitting there who are just sort of like uh, in breaking away. You know, he goes, "Dad, I'm a cutter." He goes, "You're not a cutter. I'm a cutter." You know, but they identify with the coal country. Mm-hmm. But you have people in their 20s, 30s, 40s who've never been in the mine. Sure. So that idea of bringing these jobs back is all well and good. But you're not talking about people who lost their jobs when they shut down coal 10 years ago. I, and there's not a market I for it. I agree with you. I mean, the, and the the major hit the coal comes from some combination of automation and, and fracking. Yeah, but but then so, but for him to come and sell that, that's brilliant because Trump is. You can say what you want. He's a brilliant marketer. He tells people what they want to hear in the terms they want to hear it. Yeah. He's very good at that. Yeah, the and she is, may have been economically sound in what right, she was offering, right, right, right. but it's not sexy. No, I agree with you. I think that his 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 ability to mix it up. I mean, I went to a Trump rally uh, in New Hampshire and he didn't sound like any Republican I'd ever heard. Mm. Uh, and so you could selectively hear things there that would appeal to you both in terms of kind of social safety nets and other things that he wasn't going to mess with as well. And, and he had the whole swamp argument, right? This whole thing that he was the swamp. He knew the yeah. swamp and he was going to pull the plug on the swamp. <laughs> and so trust me, right? Just believe me, all these words, right? And so I think that because he had this just strange 
strange persona and this weird admixture of positions, um, he was almost like a third party onto himself. There was someone said, I think it was uh, Pod Save America, but they had a great thought about the Trump rallies. It says basically you're going to watch him do his greatest hits, that there's a rhythm to everything. He starts off with lock her up, then drain the swamp, and then you know he yells, build a wall, who's going to pay for it? Everyone shouts back, Mexico. He said that, but every... There, and then people get bored halfway through and start filtering out. But but it's sort of like going to see uh, uh, Leonard Skinner do Freebird, you know, as yeah. you said. But every one of the polls or the or every one of these rallies are the same. That's true. Hey, I'm going to go grab a glass of water. Why don't we take a quick break? And when we come back, let's see if we can bring this back to Maryland right. a little bit and good talk point. a little bit about Maryland and see All what's right. going on here. Very All right. Good. When you're a community bank, you help your community however you can. Like being there for local business people. Backing them up when they start up. Advising them when they ask. Standing by them so they can grow. Helping local businesses is one of the most important things we do at Severn Bank. I'm Alan Hyatt, Chairman of the Bank. But I'm also a proud supporter of businesses in Anne Arundel County. You know we never forget that here at the bank, we're a local business too. We face the same challenges and opportunities as any business. And we know how fortunate we are to have customers who stand beside us. That's why we stand beside you. If you have a business or you want to start a business, talk with us. Because we're banking on you. Severn Bank, here with you. Online at SevernBank.com. Member FDIC, Equal Housing Lender. Severn Bank is a trade name used by Severn Savings Bank. And we are back here with Dr. Dan Natap, who is the director of uh, the Center for Social... Center for the Study of Local Issues. I'm going to get that right at some point. I know, it took me a, a year or two. At, at Anne Arundel County College, at Anne Arundel County Community College, That's and right. who was with us on primary night, who was indispensable for our debate when we had it with Mayor Panelides and Gavin Buckley a couple of weeks ago, is here with us. And we've been talking a little bit of national politics. For, I think he and Jared Lippman could have taken the, over the podcast for us that night and done a better job. They mm-hmm. were chatting along the way for a while. You guys are really good. Yeah. I enjoy but, Jared's. One of the key things of your of the survey that you do yes. is is your is the local issues and you're right. the, the center for local issues. That's right. And in reading the article in the Capitol, it said obviously, well, no, maybe not so obviously, that drugs were the highest, <laughs> the biggest concern. Right. For your respondents this time, was that a surprise to you? Well, it's not a surprise insofar as last time it the we hit almost exactly the same numbers, uh, but it's up a lot from one year ago. In other words, we do these twice a year, one in spring and one in fall. So spring, the, the movement had been essentially between fall of last year, one year ago, and spring. Uh, there was the that's where the big rise in concern uh, for drugs and, and you know sort of crime drugs it occurred in that six month period and it was stable in other words it didn't change um, for fall of this year um, and so now it's it's like the stable number one you know I think that kind of um, probably corresponds with how the crime and and the use of the drugs that we're seeing on a policing level uh-huh. goes as well because for a while there there was nothing there nothing there and then all of a sudden it, it jumped up and again year over year we look at the county it's up but it's it's elevated but it's not this huge leaps but it is still climbing and it's still, yeah. it's still a concern there i'm looking at the chart right now i have it up here on the apple tv so if we look at the last six surveys seven surveys so that's from fall of 14 to fall of 17 and you have a, a line graph here that uh, shows you exactly how it is in, increased or decreased as far as the most important problem as a perception. Right. So you have two taxes that are too high, transportation, crime and drugs, growth development, economy, environment, and education. And what you see here is issues such as taxes too high plummeted from sure. three years, right. plummeted yep. from the top concern to pro- looks like almost the least of the it's concerns. Like just in the middle there, it's all bunched up. Right. And But if you look at drugs, that went from the middle of the pack right, right. Uh, three years ago to by far the most important it, concern. It's startling. I mean, just, you don't, and that, you know, it's, it's the case that the economy dominated for years. And so the atrophying of the, of concern over the economy must, has to result in something else going up. And it could have been just evenly distributed, but it wasn't. I mean, uh, you know, it could have just stayed at taxes. I think the tax issue was, if you will, cured by Hogan's election. And so, when, uh, when was he elected? He, he was 14. It was, it was in uh, 14. And you can see there's fall of 14. It starts going down in spring of 15. 
And then by fall of 15, it's already plateaued. The taxes have plateaued at a kind of lower level, and it kind of just keeps going down. But, I mean, it could have stayed at that kind of low double-digit level had there not been something else going up, and that's what drugs were doing. So um, people, you know, this is an, um, an unprompted question. The, the, the students simply ask, what's the most important problem facing residents of Anne Arundel, Anne Arundel County at the present time? That's what they ask. They, so, don't, they don't read any list. One of the most frustrating things for me as a news junkie was watching Newt Gingrich on election night, or, or actually, uh, I'm sorry, it was after one of the debates, one of the presidential debates. And Newt Gingrich was with, I can't remember which CNN commentator it was, and he said, people are more worried about crime. That, that's at the top of their list. So people are afraid. And there was a kind of a, a terse moment between the commentator and Gingrich about that. She said, crime is at a record low. And he said, but people don't feel that way. And she goes, but you people are saying, talking about the campaign, that crime is a larger problem than it is. And he goes, but people feel that way. And the frustration to me and probably to a lot of people were that you saw this narrative of crime out of control being pushed when the statistics show that it's not the case. Here's what I would say to that. Uh, I don't know that uh, concern over drug use is the same as concern, concern over crime, which are lumped together. Yeah, on the question. Here, I, they're, they're, they're discreet. I put them together because it kind of has historically been, you know, illegal drugs. And so it's illegal things, right? But I think that uh, this the, the current wave of concern over drugs is much more health concern than it is driven by a kind of sense in which we got to go get those drug dealers and that's the crime part. It's just the, the propensity for people to die from overdoses because of fentanyl. Which has been on the rise. I mean, that's the problem. I mean, there are twice as many people who die a year in Baltimore City from that than die from being shot and murdered. And so it's a, it's a rising and, and, and significant concern as a health issue. This is why, and I mentioned this in the press release, um, we asked about a needle exchange program. All right. Now, Anne Arundel County uh, is probably not a perfect um, melting pot for the generous ways of dealing with addicts, right? You would think that they'd be kind of personal responsibility. You know, this is something you could deal with. Because, of, uh, because it's right-leaning and it's pers personal responsibility? Well, it, it's, you know, it's per it can easily be perceived as it's just bad choices. Right. And if you want to, you could stop. And often it is. But... Uh, on a needle exchange program, uh, even when I was explaining this to my students, they're going, huh? Uh, we're providing clean needles so that addicts can uh, avoid getting contaminated and contaminating others with HIV and who knows what else. Right? It, this is like giving up. It's saying this is going to happen. Addicts are going to be addicts and we can't move fast enough to remove their addictive habits. And so all we can do is contain, is, it. Is, is contain it so it doesn't become an even bigger health hazard. Right? Well, also, that's a cheaper solution. I mean, clean hypodermic needles in an exchange program is far cheaper than prevention problems and treatment problems. Sure. That, that could be. And maybe the penny-pinching mindset of Anne Arundel County folks said, oh, yeah, that's a better sort of choice. But it still seemed to me that that was a pretty high number. I got a majority in favor of that. If well, I, I thought that's unusual. That I saw that in there because yeah. that's something that I didn't think of. I mean, you've got all the talk about the safe stations and, and treatment and the police have Every jurisdiction has come out and said, you know, we're not going to be able to arrest our way out of this right. drug problem. Right. We need to get a hold of it here. And it's not necessarily, you know, giving them clean needles to do it. It's giving them the help that they need to help themselves. Yeah. And I, I just thought that was kind of fascinating because that, that needle swap seemed like an arcane idea to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, to my mind, it was just a, a cry of desperation. Right. If, if we're willing to go with that, that just reinforces the idea that this is a big, a big problem. And the, the public is just grasping for solutions. Well, it's also, I think it's important to remember that this is perception. This isn't what, so we're looking at these lines here. They don't indicate real issues. So, I mean, four years ago, if you had said, what's the largest problem? You'd see on this, not, maybe not on this, but on a national one, Ebola. Because four years ago or three years ago, everyone was fired up that Ebola was coming. They were talking about shutting down airlines from Africa, but didn't mean that there was an actual issue. It was just the perception of a problem. Yeah, what but it was. I think with the uh, the opiate stuff, but, is, but, is is much more. No, I agree with you. On I that. mean, I've asked. I asked a, a year and a half ago. I asked people, "Do you know a friend or family member?" who's got a dependence on a prescription painkillers, heroin, coke, uh, marijuana, and alcohol. The, the, the leader was alcohol, but prescription drugs, 
was, uh, I think it was next at 16%, 31% out said alcohol, 16% said prescription drugs, and 11% said heroin. That's, that's one out of, you know, you're in a room with, with 20 yep. people. That's two people who know, and who know somebody. And, and, an anecdotally, I live, I live my life for 50 plus, 52 years without knowing anybody that was directly impacted by heroin yeah. and, and opioids. Uh, in the last four years, I have four friends that have lost kids. Oh, no. Because of it. And I know others that are still struggling and dealing with their kids. And you read about it day in and day out. I mean, just this morning in the newspaper, they're talking about Sheriff Bateman's stepson had an opioid issue and threatened him. Yeah. Uh, so now, you know, Allegedly. Well, it's according to the police report. Allegedly. So. But I'm not I mean, so that, that is a problem, though. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, 20 years of heroin. You know, no, that's just, you know, those the, the homeless game, the few homeless guys on the streets of the big city that are shooting up needles. That's was my impression of it. But now it's in Savannah Park. It's everywhere. Yeah, it's, it's mainstreamed. It's, right. And now, so, and yeah. the, the other issues that kind of surprised me was that the most important problems list that you saw the economy plummeted as well from 14 to now, that, that steadily too. There's mm-hmm. no spikes in there that fell from the top of the list of people considered to be an issue. And growth and development saw a significant increase as perception of the problem. Yeah, yeah. The economy on a lot of different indicators seems to be doing you know pretty well. And it's not just objective numbers like the unemployment rate, but I, it's like 91 I, straight I ask a lot of questions of about the economy and on virtually, I mean, just the rating question, how would you rate the uh, uh, economic conditions in, and then we say county, state, and country, mm-hmm. and all of them are going up. Even the country went up. I mean, it's like... Well, here's a question for you on the economy, which is, we've often been said that Maryland and Anne Arundel County and whatnot is somewhat insulated from the ebbs and flows of the economy because of our proximity to Washington and the workforce and everything else. Do we have an inflated sense of the economy here, whereas somebody in West Virginia would be like, oh, God, no. Oh, we're more optimistic you mean because we've not felt any of the effects significantly? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, the like if you ask this question, government is a, a big employer, and uh, as long as the DC metro area includes uh, a fair number of people from Anne Arundel County who either commute to jobs right, right in around DC or go out to Fort Meade, uh, and that's become, you know, a, a, a gold coast of employment of all sorts. Um, those are booing uh, the local economy and insulating it from the drama of the national economy. You know, we're not a county that is really deindustrialized. Uh, we haven't had a point. I always find the startling statistics in 1940, uh, 75% of the people in Anne Arundel County lived in Annapolis. Wow. There's a statistic It's for a you. startling statistic, you know. Uh, and now it's, it's less than 10%. Uh, so all these people came in as basically suburbanites, right? They, they, they flowed in after World War II and went down Ritchie Highway and populated it from Baltimore. And Which then, mirrored the rest of the, the growth of the suburbs from, from that time. For, say again? That mirrored the, the growth of the suburbs from around the country at the same sure, time. Sure, sure, yeah. But I, I think the point is is that we're not a place which had smokestack industries and those then went down, boom, right. and we had to reinvent ourselves. We were agriculture, you know? We were the state capital and then agriculture. Culture. And so uh, what we invented was the post-war economy. Uh, and we had the good fortune of having, you know, big government come into our lives and provide, you know, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of jobs regionally. Uh, you know, we're... F- directly or indirectly. I mean, lobbyists, uh, support groups. Yeah. Uh, even, you know, support. I mean, f- the, the old saying, uh, Fed, Ed, Med, right? Uh, you go federal government, educational institutions, and lots of medical gold things. Oh, we have all that. And so, yeah. And so, well, not so much Anne Arundel County, per se, Maryland does, but we have a, a significant part of it. You know, you got AMC and, and, and Baltimore, Washington as uh, medical. They have two important medical centers. That's interesting. You I never thought BW, about that. Yeah, BWI. You got the Naval Academy. Pittsburgh, which was industrial, obviously, you know, it was classically, and they, they got walloped in the 60s and 70s and the late 80s and 90s. They reinvented themselves as a medical center. And they've really kind of come back from that, that recession that just plagued them 
them for decades. And they had Carnegie, you got Mellon and other schools there. Yeah, that, Pitt that, and all that. Yeah. You know, they need that. The Ed part, if you haven't got Ed, um, you know, you, you don't, you can't, it's hard to reinvent yourself because you can't bring in, you know, even Anne Arundel County is a kind of a funny place. Like I say, right now it's tracking nationally. In my polls, we're tracking Gallup within a point or two. So uh, it, it's not like this is Trump country, even though, uh, you know, a year ago, if, if you'd asked me, I'd say, you know, kind of characterize Anne Arundel County. Yeah, I'd say it leans on a conservative way. Uh, the party registration numbers are actually um, more uh, to advantage of Democrats. But you get a lot of un unaffiliated military types who tend to be pretty conservative. And so you add them all together and it sort of leans a little more to the right than it leans to the left. But how do we then get ourselves at 35 percent on Trump approval and compare that to Hogan approval at 75 percent? You know, it's not, that's, a, that's, it's not that's, a party. I mean, you know, it's like this is two different personalities, two different ways of approaching government. And, you know, one is is talking to those forgotten people out in Rust Belt and all this. Other. Another, that's just not who he is, right? It's just that he's a different persona and he has a different kind of way of approaching. And he's not, you know, pursuing this ultra uh, conservative agenda that Trump is pursuing. What do you think? Uh, do you think Hogan, dis Hogan distancing himself? And I, I wouldn't say he necessarily distanced himself, but he's just sort of uh, keeping Trump at arm's length. Right. Is helping out that 75 percent. Yeah, I, 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 he's playing, like I say, he's, he's kind of got it going both ways. On the one hand, he wants to say, I'm the guy who's going to be the counterbalance of the Democratic General Assembly. It's going to want to raise your taxes and provide services to everybody, you know, they can think of. Well, I'm not going to let them do the, all that. I'm going to be the hedge, right? And so that's a position that I think, you know, again, Baltimore County has got a million people right. in it. They kind of like someone like that. That's an appealing kind of mm -hmm. view. I mean, Kevin Kamenez on his stump speech talks about the fact that Baltimore County hasn't raised its taxes in 25 years. Right. And so it's, it's like he knows what's, what's out there and he got appealed to that. Um, so he, he, as a fiscal conservative, Hogan is able to play that angle well enough. Uh, I don't know that he's really changed the dynamic of spending, the, the amount of spending in the aggregate, but he seems like his heart is in the right place. And so a lot of persuadable purple voters kind of go, Oh, I don't mind that. On the other hand, I think he understands that a lot of the programs that keep Maryland in place can't disassemble. And so he's not going to go out and kind of tear them apart and just have a, a war on, on the democratic legacy of, of the last. Well, you uh, find that years. you find that with any kind of a newly born politician uh, that they find out that all of a sudden the things they can't disassemble that they thought. I mean, I know, you know, Trump has come in and obviously run into his walls. You look at Hogan, he certainly has. I mean. You know, Bush and Miller came out of that session equal winners as, as Hogan did on some items. Yeah. I mean, they gave and, and whatnot. Mayor Panelides did as well in Annapolis. He says, oh, we're going to do this, this, this. And they're like, yeah, no, you can. <laughs> it's, it's not the way it works. So I'm looking at the chart here, which is the right direction percentage for county, state, and nation mm -hmm. from fall of 12 to fall 17. So five years. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of interesting. So we have three lines, which is, are we going in the right direction? You have the nation, the state, and the county. Right. So fall of 12, which was the election, so there's a, a plummet that for our, as a nation, are we going in the right direction? Mm -hmm. And then it goes back, it creeps back up over years. Well, um, fall of 12, 13, I think, was the sequester. One of the sequesters created that the, drop. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So now we look at state. And so fall of 12, the state. Or it's a shutdown of government. It's not it's a sequester was part of it. But gotcha. It's a shutdown of government when the Republicans. Was it that long ago? Wow. Yeah. If time flies. So is the state going the right direction? That's crept up since right. 12. That was, the, that was the Hogan effect, right? 27% was uh, O'Malley's job approval in fall of 14. And that's where the state was in right direction, 27%. Gotcha. Two were the same. Because that was also, I'm trying to remember when the, the taxes and fees, because that was an unpopular move where we were told, you know, pass the referendum on table games and gambling, or we have to raise taxes and fees. So we all passed it and we got taxes and fees, you know, and yeah. I think that really hit him hard. I agree. Uh, but if we look at the county, that has remained pretty, pretty consistent. Stable. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't really go up and down much because I don't, you know, it, it's interesting because you think something must affect the county. I mean, you see little jumps and variations. 
I don't have it on this chart, but the, the, I do have a different chart which shows that during uh, part of the uh, Leopold administration, we saw the, the biggest drop, uh, and that was right in tune with uh, the scandal that was unfolding. Okay. Which I, 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 you, you had that chart up a little bit earlier. It was the two opposing ones getting in the right direction. Right here. The wrong, there it is. The, it's where the two lines yeah. almost meet. Right. That's, you can see the one at, when we're, it drops to 43% for the county right direction. That was a Leopold moment. Uh, so, and yeah. then it jumped back up, you know, get rid of him and we're back to 50%. But you find that to be kind of the case generally is that we remain fairly consistent in the county? We're fairly. Yeah, I think because, again, the county doesn't experience wide uh, swings in, in general situation. Uh, it stays pretty steady. And, and again, this is a lot of it is due because of a, maybe over reliance on government work, work you know, provided directly or indirectly by government, the federal government, military, something. And so we just don't have lots of ups and downs. Um, like I said, I think that the Hogan moment was well appreciated. Anthony Brown got 32 percent of the vote. Right, got 32%. Uh, a Democrat in, in Anne Arundel County needs to get 38%. Right? You can't win that's your statewide. Role. Your that's rule of thumb. The, that's the number. Well, I did a regression where I regressed Anne Arundel County on, on uh, state outcomes overall, and that was the number you have to hit. So he was six points below his target number. Uh, and he lost by, I think, four points, three or four points. And do you think that was a referendum on O'Malley's job performance? A little bit, yeah. I mean, I think there was kind of O'Malley fatigue. Uh, some of the reasons you allude to, uh, the things that sort of happened under O'Malley where he was dealing with the Great Recession and trying to keep programs up, keep ed spending up and so forth. So he went and raised taxes. And, you know, people like the spending. I always say people are, are liberals on spending and conservatives on taxation. And so um, he uh, went, uh, you know, to his left and and by trying to keep up the level of spending when a period, during a period when revenues were going down, so he had to extract more and wasn't appreciated. Again, Hogan has been unusually lucky because a buoyant economy yeah. has generated enough revenue to do it all. So we have, yeah, I think was, I said weeks before, but it was ninety straight, ninety-one straight months of growth, uh, economic I mean, growth. You know, strong growth, reasonable revenues. Um, you don't have to be the bad guy, right? You don't have to go and start talking. You can leave about taxes it. where they are because the assessments That's are right. going to go up after the. I mean, there's you know, it depends on the nature of, of what's of what taxes you're relying on but even on state income tax as long as people are employed they're getting salary and boom there it is your right. income tax just holds up because of employment is there anything that surprised you in the survey this time um, you know it's a surprise is always an interesting word um, I use it as much as I can no, yeah, it's a journalist uh, pet word you know we did some stuff on dis perceptions of discrimination we had never done those before and uh, I didn't really know what to expect. I created a bunch of categories of obvious and not so obvious uh, targets of possible perceptions of, of discrimination. So what turns out to be the most discriminated group that, uh, you know, they had a lot, um, some, little or no, right? Those were the three choices. The most discriminated group with the highest percentage saying a lot. Was Tall, gawky, white guys. Transgendered oh, right. people, trans. You know, and that and that's funny. The Maryland State Police just released the statistics for 2015 yesterday on that, and I don't have the numbers right here in front of me. But transgender was like the least discriminated. And the most discriminated, as far as demographics, were uh, white males for whatever reason. Well, we asked about uh, white males, followed by black, gay. You know, sexual orientation was one of them, transgender, and then it jumped down into like religious and, and whatnot as far as the number yeah, of incidents. Yes, a little bit of all that. Um, you know, again, the leader was transgendered, 53% said a lot. And it was also the case when we asked about um, Trump's policy of banning transgendered people from the military, I think that got the lowest level of support of any policy we asked about. So, Even from the right, which is surprising. Yeah, right? I mean, it's, it is, this was just a loser issue. I, you know, that and the, and the DACA issue, 
were kind of loser issues. And I don't know why. I mean, I transgendered came out of nowhere. There's no particular, right. uh, nothing that he said during his campaign that said to me, if this guy gets elected, he's going to ban transgendered. I just never recall that as any part. So he just picked that one as a, as a soft target. But it was a horrible target because it's not, it's the public opinion just isn't there. And DACA is more along his lines, immigrants and all that. Sure. Um, but he was, you know, kind of conflicted about it since this is the kids, innocence and so forth and so on. And that, I think, is how the public generally sees it. These are innocents. You can't really blame them for the sins of their parents and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. But in terms of discrimination, the second most discriminated group were African Americans. Uh, and they were in the 40s. And then you can see the rest of people with a criminal record. You know, how many people think of them as a discriminated group? But the public sees it that way. Um, Interesting. Yeah. And then the physical and mental uh, disabilities is still up there. That surprises me. It's something, it's just not, it's not I mean, apparent, I, you know, you just don't think about, you know, is that, is discrimination the right word? That's, that's, yeah, know? that's what I was thinking too. It's just, you know, do they face a lack of accommodation? Maybe that, that's something, but I, that, that one actually does surprise me. Yeah. And then at the bottom, you're getting. You Native know, Americans is interesting to me because you know, there are really not a lot of Native that's Americans. Right, that's and, right. This is an empathy thing and a kind of historical thing, but it's not like a reality where you see. Something I didn't see any real Native, Native Americans till I moved to New Mexico. That was the first time in my life where I saw Native Americans on uh, in uh, in real uh -huh. life. I just uh -huh. everything else was conceptual because there's, there's, there's no reservations on the East Coast. It's not very common. So atheists and white men rounded so up the atheists bottom. Atheists and white men. So you know, I don't know, man. You try and get elected as an atheist. More 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 discriminated again by four points if you have the two top categories. You could you could not get an atheist elected into any elected I office. I agree, and I, you know on the online part of the poll. There, I allow people to comment. And so there, you'll get people who will, who will rant uh, about something. Oh, those are my people. Mm. Uh, well, you'll get them, you know, uh, some people said atheists are the most discriminated people. They're worse than Muslims. They'll, they'll make <laughs> yeah, that I'd, explicit comparison yep. and say, you know, they couldn't be, they're, they're repudiated every, you know, you can't get a, well, maybe in Berkeley you could get a, an atheist elected. Or, even then, know. like e even people who are far to the left, they still, they, they draw the line at atheism because that's just crazy to them. I, I don't know. I, I mean, um, but we had a, a reasonably large group. I mean, I think it's, the atheist segment is growing and it's younger. They said that by in 10 years, I saw there was the report today that in 10 years that one third of the country will identify as non-religious because mm. that is the fastest oh, growing. Churches are having a tough time left and right. I mean, yeah. they're, you know, getting people in, their monies are down. Yeah, millennials places. especially, you yeah. know, for that reason. <laughs> hey, look, as, as we, as we start to wrap up, I got to cut just a couple questions and burn in in my mind here. Okay. And I'm, I'm looking at you with county executive shoe as Having a very good approval rating. It's best gone best, up. Best that he's had. Yeah. And we don't have any other questions regarding county executives, but we did on the governor. I mean, you got Governor right. Larry Hogan. You talked about other people that may be running as a Democrat. And mm. you named it uh, Ben Jealous, Kevin Kamenetz, and Rush and Baker as being right. the top three. Right, right. Others there. Is this indicative of looking at your past polls the fall before an election? Does this correlate with that? Have you ever well, looked at that? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I mean, taking a look yeah. at this, I mean, I would sit there and say, okay, well, Hogan's going to win it. And then on the Democratic side, if in a primary, it looks like Ben Jealous is going to get that. Yeah, it's it's really, really early. Um, I, I think that without really much of a campaign, it's it's very hard to predict how it all shake out. Right. Uh, and so spring you know, probably be better. Yeah, we'll know more by spring because then we will have campaigns, ads, and so forth, and uh, you know, rally and candidate events. And so right now, you know, we got more people who say I don't know than say they're they're not voting for Ogan, but they when asked, well, then are you voting? I don't know is their answer. And right. so, you know, again, because we're so kind of tightly woven into the political scene, we some, somehow get the illusion that most people are. Most people are. No, they're not. Right. You're right. And so, you know, they spend nanoseconds a month thinking about, you know, who's up, who's down. And all I'll this let stuff. you know on November 7th. But, you know, when I, I walk mean, in. I'll the... make the decision the last week or two. But why do I? Why are you asking me now? It's a year and a half before the election. You've got to be nuts. And, I, you know, it's they're kind of right. <laughs> Well, the data data in here is is fascinating, and we're going to make sure that we put the document actually up when we put the show notes on the Perfect. website and everything else. But is this done in other counties that you're aware of? No, no. I think we are the only uh, community college in America that does these regular polls every semester. 
It's I don't know of anybody else that does it. Wait, how valuable would that be if Howard and PG and uh, hope I don't say PG. I got yelled oh, at yeah, from yeah, Western yeah, Prince, not. Prince George's County. You know, Absolutely. but all, all of the counties put them together and then yeah. they had you know maybe the brilliant minds, the the Doctor Dan's of every county would come sure. together and come with a statewide. I mean, it would be a great thing to have happen because it, we could theoretically coordinate, have some common questions, and then have some really localized questions, and then we can compare where we are on the common questions and then let the locals uh, do their own thing. Well, it'd be fascinating and, to me. You talk about the drug issue here, okay, which has been sort of a non-issue in Anne Arundel County for so long, the opioid issue. Uh-huh. And now all of a sudden it's at, at the forefront. Right, right. Uh, I'm going to Without knowing, I'm going to say that in Baltimore City, it's probably a, de- a routine thing that's been going on for decades. Possibly. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, no, I'm just worried about. Yeah, I mean, you're going to get a lot of poverty issues, things that are evocative of the life of people in poverty in Baltimore City. And you're just not going to get it here. You know, it's like uh, homelessness. Uh, it's probably politically incorrect. To say we don't have much homelessness, but I think if you go to Baltimore City and ask what's the dimensions of homelessness there, it's vast. And so uh, uh, Anne Arundel County just doesn't have the kind of you know ghetto-like qualities that you see in a right. place like Baltimore City. Not all of Baltimore, but there are clearly areas like that. Right. So, yeah. How do you select? I mean, can anybody? volunteer to get on this or is this just totally a random you mean uh, as a person called as a respondent yeah yeah, yeah. um no we get our numbers from uh, a company uh, that generates um you know provides for, goes to listed white page numbers adds some unlisted numbers and then uh throws in some other numbers i i ask them numbers that are associated with between uh, for people between 18 and 40 and those are, um, they're not purely random numbers, but they're numbers that, uh, that they have pooled together. These are great repositories of databases where they can give you the name, the address, and the age uh, of the person. And okay. so we, we blend both databases together, the, the white page listed, the unlisted, and then these others, which do include cell phones. Um, and so by putting them all, which is probably a great thing now. <laughs> well, everyone's you know, cutting the landlines. Yeah, it's you can't do landlines only anymore unless you, all you want to know is how retirees feel. Now, do you pay for your data or for the numbers? Is that uh, I pay for some. Um, the part the the landline numbers I get free from the same company because they they see it as some altruistic mission to give people like me um, the ability to do this without you got them fooled. Yes, I, I, I hope they're not listening. But there is, it's not really fooled because it is what it is. And so we're not doing, no one's going to pay, we're not contracted out to do this. Uh, if I, if I contract, I've not got a contract with the, the library system. And so we do private work for, for, for usually government organizations. And, uh, they're paying me. I, I bid, I build in the cost of, of acquiring whatever it is. In this case, it's, it was just uh, addresses um, because we're doing not a phone survey, but a mail survey. So we pay for that. And um, and I don't expect them to generate those free. It's not, there's right. nothing, there's no reason to. And so, uh, but yeah, they're a good company. We try to get all our data that we pay for from them. Well, I'll tell you, this is a fascinating study. Um, you can get more. And actually, it's a, you've got a weird web address, but it's www2. Right. Dot aacc.edu slash CSLI, which is the Center for the Study, study of Local Issues. Here, that's right. <laughs> Nailed it. Very good. Um, you got and, the acronym. You know, Dr. Dan Natap. And it, take a look at this study, and we will put it on the uh, on the website. It's actually, yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. And to get a, an insight in the minutia of the lifestyle, really, that we have here in Anne Arundel County, what you know, not your next door neighbor necessarily. Well, maybe, but you know, what, what our communal neighbors are really thinking and how, um, you know, where it is and be kind of interesting. I always look through and go like, Oh yeah, no, no, I don't, I don't think that. And, you know, try to figure out where it makes a lot of sense and where it doesn't, but it's a, a fascinating study. It comes out twice a year from Anne Arundel County Community College and the only one in the country I've learned. That is my impression. I don't know of anyone else who does regular every semester polling. How much uh, time does it take you to do this? Uh, you personally, takes, what 
takes hours and hours um, for you know it takes hours and hours for days and days and so uh, you know where there's a big build up first we have to design the survey and that is a lot of effort and gnashing of teeth and so forth and so on uh, I really have a process with an advisory board and I meet with them uh, a first time and I throw out a draft and we talk about it then a week later I've edited it and taken their advice and then I give them another draft we talk more about it and then kind of we're getting pretty close to that point then it's sort of in final edit by the time I incorporate whatever suggestions they have the second meeting and so then the, the, the student recruitment phase takes place and make sure we have enough bodies uh, to staff the phones right and then uh, it's um, writing the, the press release um, and that's done over a weekend, a long weekend, where I start I start with the data uh, kind of massaging, waiting, as I was mentioning, on Friday. That takes a while to get it weighted just right. And then uh, the Saturday, Sunday, and part of Monday goes just to writing it. I mean, the thing's almost 60 pages long. So, you know, it's, it's I'm writing, you know. 15, yeah, no, it's not, it's not a, a one-page cover a sheet. To, yeah, I mean, the, 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 there, there, the is a cliff, there is a cliff note version. Yeah, but there is, there is. So, you know, I don't want people to be afraid. But, you know, to get a lot of the longitudinal stuff, you know these questions that over years we've been doing them and trends and all that you got to you got to update the charts you got to say what's what's new about them and so forth so it takes me three kind of full days of writing uh to get that all together and then few it's finally done it goes for a kind of internal approval and little minor edits uh and then it goes out uh, first to the capital and then the rest of the world um and then i come on to shows like this and talk about it to do the circuit well, there you go. Yeah, that's it. Dr. Natef, again, as always, thank you very much. Always good to see you. It is a blast. Uh, seems like we've thank seen you. an awful lot of you. Hey, you want to do something on uh, election night? Um, I have already told. Um, oh, don't pull this whole wife thing into it again, okay? <laughs> Jane is not my wife, but uh, I promised to stay with her some period of time. She can now. come. There, solved. There it is. <laughs> I, I think if she could get paid to come, she would. John will pay her, yeah. But, uh, you know, that will be the challenge. So, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that it won't be a late night, uh, I hope. Yeah, I don't. Uh, you know, so it's not um, something where we're going to sort of sit here and um, right. have a lot of time to sort of churn about, uh, you know, what's happening, what's who's up, who's down. But, you know, there are some compet. There's at least a couple competitive uh, aldermanic districts. Wards. All right, real, real quick before we go, one yeah. I want one word Oops. from you. One word answer from you. Yeah. The word is either Panellides or Buckley. Who's going to win this mayor's election? Uh, I am always wrong. That's, see, that's so like- <laughs> I'm going to say Panellides. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, thanks, doctor. No problem. This has been the Maryland Crabs podcast with Tim Hamilton and John Fernay. Sure to follow them in all the regular places, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and online at themarylandcrabs.com. Take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Now, get the hell out of my kitchen. Seriously, go! You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.